The Great Smoky Mountains National Park is the most visited national park in the United States. Covering 187,000 acres, you'll find a diversity of plants and animals and, of course, horrors. This is darkness prevails after all, we can't go anywhere without discovering all the horrors that exist or may exist in places. From honeymoons gone disturbingly wrong to horrifying unexplained disappearances, there's much to fear in the Great Smoky Mountains. Enjoy, and be sure to send me your scary stories at darkstories.org so I can narrate them. Also check out our other show, Freaky Folklore, on Spotify or iTunes if you want more scary fun. Also, if you want to catch me playing some Resident Evil Village, go to Brintendo, my gaming channel. Yeah, yeah, everyone's got a gaming channel, but it helps me to relax and be myself. Anyway, let's begin. During our honeymoon in the Smoky Mountains, my husband and I caught the attention of something unknown and terrifying for an entire week. From Reddit user Wolf underscore Dream. Trigger warning for suicide. About a month ago, a user by the name of Sniper6407 asked if anyone had ever had strange experiences in southern Tennessee and a few other nearby places, particularly in the mountains. I had too much going on to respond at the time, but my husband and I had an experience there that I think is worth telling, although most in our family don't know, because we understand how they would react, so we've never told them. While I realize this post relates many over-the-top experiences, my husband and I both experienced the following as described. I understand that not everyone will believe me, but since this post also contains deeply personal moments in my life, I ask that you please keep comments respectful, whatever opinions you express on the matter. Thank you. This story needs background to convey some factors that were potentially involved. I suspect the events leading up to the trip to Tennessee may have had a direct relation to the severity of the phenomenon we experienced while there. I had never wanted to marry, neither had my now husband. Then we met each other, and we were engaged at 30 and 28 years old. We had a two-year engagement. We wanted our wedding to symbolize our true soul bond and decided to go completely non-traditional. His giant family wanted a white dress Catholic wedding, so we were at major odds with the family from day one. My fiancé and I began suffering from a huge run of exceptionally bad luck and some odd poltergeist activity at home. Nothing too major, so we brushed it off. Except when we left the house once and came back to find a red clown nose sitting front and center on our bathroom sink. No one had the keys to our place and we didn't own a darn clown nose. That one was freaky. When I told a friend something weird was going on to the point I almost felt the wedding was cursed, he tried to explain it away. I replied, Watch, something's going to happen today while he's getting his tux, I'm telling you. I get one flabbergasted look before my fiancé immediately called to say there'd been a freak accident in the parking lot while he was getting fitted for his tux and someone had totaled the back end of his truck. That shut my friend right up. Another glitch was my refusal to have my father walk me down the aisle. I also refused a random stand-in for tradition's sake. I asked my younger brother to walk me down the aisle and he said he would be so honored. We'd had some problems, but he'd been clean for seven years and we'd made up our differences. Losing our middle brother to a drunk driver had driven us apart for a while but brought us back closer a little later down the road. Then, 40 days before the wedding, unintentionally, my brother committed suicide in his mid-twenties. My fiancé and I drove over 16 hours close to Point Pleasant, West Virginia, to say goodbye. I knew my brother, and I knew he would not cross over easily with what he'd done, especially with my wedding around the corner and me counting on him. This really bothered me. 
His viewing was closed to immediate family only. He was not embalmed due to the complete autopsy required. He was covered in a handmade quilt to his chin. We were instructed not to touch him, although we ignored this stricture. After saying our goodbyes, I walked to the end of his gurney and lay my hands on his feet. A supplicant, I told him I understood it was an accident, and I forgave him. I told him that if he still felt he needed to make amends with me, then he could do so by calling forth my loved ones and those of my fiancé to come witness the wedding from the other side. I bade him bring our other brother, my fiancé's sister, grandparents, aunts, friends, and I began calling by name all those beloved souls whom had already passed. Do this, I told him, and there will be no debt between us, and he can rest in peace. The looks on my family's faces were priceless at this point, but I felt this was something I needed to offer. I had a pendant made when I returned to New Orleans. On it was my favorite picture of my two brothers. I wrapped this around my bouquet, and although it seemed to the wedding guests that I walked the aisle alone, I knew that both my sweet brothers were right beside me in spirit, because they would never miss the wedding of their sister, especially with Hector, the one who committed suicide, actively dragging them across the veil to fulfill his last obligation to the living. Later on, my new husband, Eli, and I went to a rental cabin on Bluff Mountain for a honeymoon week. I don't want to name the specific cabin in case I'm not supposed to, but I will say it was very rocky with a raccoon theme. Bluff Mountain is in Pigeon Forge, outside of Gatlinburg in the Smoky Mountains. I was living in New Orleans and had brought a double handful of fresh-picked gardenia blossoms with me. It was a type of symbolic offering to the mountain for having us on such a special occasion. No rituals or anything, I simply arranged them on a wooden box with a fake bird and nest that was sitting on the top of the railing of the cabin porch and sent up feelings of gratitude and joy. We went out to eat and grab groceries. Upon arriving back at the cabin, the wooden bird box had been smashed into a million pieces on the porch. It hit the ground hard enough to shatter so far and so thoroughly. We thought that maybe a raccoon or bear had done it. Then I noticed that there were no flowers. Maybe the wind. Leaves that had been scattered all over the porch, just like when we left, made me hesitate. Gardenias aren't super light flowers, definitely heavier than the leaves I saw. More curious than anything, I looked all around the porch, stairs, and walkway. I shrugged it off until the next morning, when I went a little way down the driveway to pick some honeysuckle. About 20 feet from the porch, I glanced down and did a double take. There lay my gardenias, all of them. They had been piled up and squished flat as crepes. There were no shoe prints, but it took more than one stop to flatten the pile like that. Unnerved, I walked away wondering if the mountain didn't like my offering after all, then laughed at myself for the thought. Night One Eli woke up suddenly to what sounded like something big banging the support beams under the cabin. The cabin hung off the side of a hill, so the front half was supported about 15 feet off the forest floor by giant wooden posts. They were being hit so hard that the mirror on the wall was vibrating, which, frankly, should be physically impossible for anyone to do. Eli said every time he started to drift back off, there was another bang. He gets up, fully, and after one more cabin-shaking bang, he decides to wake me. Apparently, he was trying to see if I would wake from the banging, so he would know he wasn't dreaming. But now he was 100% up, as he reached for me, he said the loudest bang or slap came from the area between the sitting area slash kitchen right at the bottom of the bed. It was a one-room cabin. He said it sounded like a giant book getting dropped from high up, but he was looking right there, and there was nothing. This bang was definitely inside the cabin. He began frantically trying to wake me, but he said I was so deeply asleep 
he actually thought something was wrong with me. He said he could barely tell I was breathing. Then, this strange metallic jangling sounded from behind the TV, directly across the cabin from our bed. He said it went on forever, but he was too scared to go look for whatever it was over there next to the huge windows past the spot where the noise originated from inside. It was this insistent buzzing that finally woke me. I remember it was so hard to come back to consciousness. I felt like I was literally swimming through blackness to get back to myself. I kept asking what the heck is that noise? I thought it was an alarm someone left set. Cute. When I finally woke up enough to move and set up to go find and smash the offending noisemaker, the trilling stopped. Groaning, I fell backwards onto my pillow. Eli began telling me about the banging. I could tell how upset my husband was. I believed what he was telling me, but I was so numb and out of it, I was struggling to come up with any emotional response at all. There was only this debilitating fatigue and I fell asleep on my husband when he needed me, when a man whom I'd never seen afraid in seven years was completely terrified, I just zonked out until morning. Normally, I'm an extremely light sleeper, especially in new places. This trip, however, almost every night was like this. No sooner did I put my head on the pillow than I was swallowed by blackness. It was extremely deep sleep, but it wasn't restful. Waking up was worse. It was like falling into a coma every night and slowly reviving every morning. It ironically left me exhausted. Day and night too. While doing my makeup in the infamous shaking mirror the next morning, I was able to get the full story and talk to Eli about it logically. Maybe a bear was rubbing against the post. He replies, it was solid bangs like a huge fist. No way a bear. And what about the one from the center of the floor on the inside? That reminded me of that stupid alarm. I told him that I was about to disable that thing. At the exact freaking second I mentioned it, that darn noise started blaring from behind the TV again. We both jumped like rabbits and laughed nervously. Heck of a way to time it. I joked. Punny. Looking behind the TV, I was surprised to see it wasn't an alarm clock, but a landline phone. An old one with a bell buzzer, which explained the horrid noise. Of course, I had to answer it. There was a minute of silence, then bursts of static. It really sounded like someone was talking, but static was obscuring their words. I told them to move to get better reception, then asked if this was cabin management. The silence garbled talk continued for a while before I hung up. I was amused, honestly, especially with the way Eli was gaping at me. When I hung up, he immediately unplugged the phone, said management had both our cells, so it was probably a prank call from someone who stayed here before. But we were not going to play along and end up in a deliverance scenario. Smart man. Phone stayed unplugged for the duration. That night we were in the hot tub on the deck. It was around the back, had a gazebo type cover around three sides, and no lights too close so bugs wouldn't be swarming you. As we're relaxing, I'm sitting on the open end, facing the enclosing wooden strips and Eli's facing me in the forest. I kept admiring the blue light behind the enclosed end. It was large, about the size of a cantaloupe, and seemed bright. But the glow over us in the hot tub was very muted. I figured it must be LED of some sort, but I'd never seen a light that shade of blue anywhere. All the other lights in and around the cabin were bright and orangey, so I remember saying how it was sweet. They went all out for mood lighting for the hot tub. Eli both looked at and commented on the light as well. When we decided to get out for the night, the light blinked on and off in what looked like a purposeful sequence before shining a few more seconds and going dark. We commented that it was strange how the light burnt out like that, and how we were sad to lose our mood lighting. 
I decided to call the next morning for a bulb. When I woke up, I first walked around the rear of the cabin to see what type of pole or other fixture was the one we needed serviced. But there was no pole, no fixture, no other light source behind the hot tub, no cables, no wires. The main office later confirmed the instability of the soil back there prevented anything that wasn't heavy duty from being installed, so no lighting was ever put back there. Whatever that light was, we both saw it, and it was apparently just eavesdropping, because we were out there about two hours, and so was it. And if it wasn't turning off or burning out, that means it was straight up disappearing. Starting the second night after coming in, my skin started to crawl and every hair on my body stood on end every time I passed the open bathroom. The bathroom was next to the bed area. Lying in bed, you could see the bathroom sink and the small window above it. The window had no curtains as it faced into the woods behind the hot tub. At this point, I still thought the blue light was man-made, yet I could swear there was something looking in the window. I'd been leaving the bathroom door open because I liked looking out at the forest from the bed but now I tried to keep it shut without Eli noticing I was being weird. Eli told me the next morning that every time he began to drift off, a resounding bang on the posts under the cabin would jolt him. He said he was freaked out because no matter how long or short a time he waited to lay his head down, it was like whatever it was knew exactly what he was doing, even though he never got out of bed. Once again, he was wide awake and terrified, and nothing he could do would rouse me even the slightest. Night 3 After scrubbing ourselves as best we could in the highly stinky sulfuric water of the cabin, we were getting ready for bed. Walking from the bathroom to the bed, I realized I forgot to shut the bathroom door. Since Eli was already lying in bed looking at me, I just kept on toward my side of the bed, telling myself to stop being ridiculous. Even though I could swear at that moment, something was looking in that window. I'd already looked out several times and couldn't see anything out of place, but I could still feel it. Eli quietly asks me if I can shut the door. Why? Because that window gives me the creeps. Talk about validation. That night I had some disturbing dreams, but I can't remember them. Eli, however, suffered a severe bout of sleep paralysis that night, although he swore it wasn't sleep paralysis because he says he sat up, kicked, and yelled at her. Now, however, he says it probably was sleep paralysis. Either way, he woke up to eerie laughter and saw what he described as a grudge-type woman standing at the end of the bed, laughing at him. I wouldn't wake. He said she wore a white dress, had pale skin, black eyes, and a horrible mouth. She had long black hair partially obscuring her face and was surrounded by a swirling black mist. She reached for him, and he sat up, yanking his legs up to his chest. This is when he started yelling at her to get out and kicking at her. Laughing, she faded out. He said he was awakened by her grabbing his ankles and giggling throughout the night and would also wake just long enough to catch glimpses of her. I was still no help. Night 4 A repeat sleep paralysis experience for Eli but he said it was even more intense this time. Same lady in white. I had also realized a trinket I brought for luck and put on the shelf next to my side of the bed was missing. It was a tiny cabin, and we tore it up looking for the next two days, but I've never seen it again. It was worthless except for personal reasons, and no valuables were missing, so I don't think someone came in and snagged it. Night 5 Whenever I sat up out of the water on the side of the hot tub, I started to get the same feeling of being watched I'd felt from the bathroom window. 
I would literally break out in goosebumps. It was Friday, and we could hear a group of, educated guess here, college kids, partying hard some distance out, but close enough to hear their screams, whoops, and cheers. Not wanting to give an intrepid, wood-savvy creeper a show, we went in. Not much else happened on night five, but troubled sleep. At one point, Eli woke to frenzied banging on a support post, but it didn't last long or repeat. Night six, final. This was an extra night we received due to the piercingly sulfuric water in the cabin. The filters needed replaced, and so they comped us a night. The water wasn't dangerous, just really, really stinky, like eau de la terre de la rotten egg, bad. And although our nights were weird, we were on our honeymoon and had just been through a tragedy. We spent our days having massive amounts of fun and doing so many awesome things, plus eating great food and drinking the good wine for dinner. Gatlinburg is an amazing place to visit. It was our last night in the hot tub. It was wonderful. Until I began to feel that intense regard from the tree line for the second night in a row. This time it was worse. I could actually feel the ill intent in this gaze. Whenever I came up to cool off, I literally found myself unconsciously wrapping my arms around myself and slipping slowly back down into the water. I reminded my new husband how many years he'd known me and asked how many times he'd known me to be scared or paranoid. I tell him, there is absolutely something aggressive in the tree line looking at me, and it is not a college kid. We could hear them again that night. He scooted over, and I moved to the covered end with him. Within five minutes of me moving, we hear a tremendous crashing from the brush behind us, and then something big stomping around directly below us. This is followed a few seconds later by more crashing and a second pair of footsteps stomping around. They sounded like human steps, but no one could make such a loud noise on the packed earth below the raised deck and cabin. We jumped up and booked it inside, soaking wet. Eli said that night was the worst for the banging. He said there was banging on at least three widely separated posts, and it went on all night. He said when they did let him sleep, the woman would come. I slept like the dead, though, unresponsive to everything. Morning of day seven, leaving day. Something was demanding my attention, pulling me back towards consciousness. At first, I thought it was the mounted police or one of the mule-pulled carriages that sometimes passed my place. No, this was definitely a whole plethora of horses, was there a parade I didn't know about? Slowly, I remembered I wasn't in New Orleans, and although what I was hearing sounded like hooves, there were no paved roads anywhere near me at the moment, just the small gravel driveway out front. Quickly snapping awake, I realized the sound was coming from the roof. I checked my phone. It was a few minutes after 8 a.m. I groaned. Why the heck would nobody tell the roofers that the cabin was booked until 11 a.m.? I looked over at Eli. He was pale and breathing very slowly. I half-heartedly poked him a few times, but he was out. Ruefully, I thought of all he'd been dealing with while I slept as deeply as he seemed to be now and left him alone. I'd been with him nearly a decade at this point, and he had never spoken of things like this before. Whatever had been going on, he deserved sleep. At least it was roofers in the sunny morning and not weird crap at 4 a.m. At this point, it crossed my mind to wonder what roofers worked on Sundays. I listened closer. It definitely sounded slightly metallic, but I decided my initial impression held. It sounded like a horse was kicking the crap out of the cabin roof. Well, what the heck do I know about roofing equipment anyway? I'd have to ask them to stop until we checked out. I pulled back the covers and swung my legs off the bed. The instant my feet touched the floor, the pounding on the roof stopped dead, and the handle to the main door 
which was about three to four steps in front of me, started jiggling violently. Two things. There was no pause between the noises. They went from on the roof, slightly towards the opposite side of the cabin above where Eli was sleeping, to the doorknob in front of me without a time delay. Also, the top half of the door was glass with a sheer curtain, which the sun was shining directly through. I could plainly see that no one was near the door. Yet, I could also see the handle rattling wildly. I yanked my feet up and dove under the blankets up to my chin like a kid. I'm ashamed to say. As soon as my feet left the floor, the doorknob stopped rattling, and the incessant pounding on the roof resumed in the same spot, again with no pause between them during the switch. I'm now staring at Eli, wondering if I should wake him. I'm scared I won't be able to, but I'm also just as scared he'll wake up and won't hear it at all. His eyelids flutter open, taking the decision out of my hands. I ask him if he hears that and thank all the gods he says yes. I'm hesitant to talk about the door when he just opened his eyes, so we talk about what it sounds like first. He also immediately goes to roofers. I ask if that sounds like a hammer to him and he says no, actually. We agree that it does sound like hooves or something slightly softer than metal. This whole time I realized we've automatically been whispering and this pounding just keeps going on and on. Looking around the cabin, we see the mirror shaking, glasses in the kitchen area rattling, the cabinets quaking. Whatever was on the roof shook the walls of the cabin repeatedly. The pounding lasted about 35 minutes, because I checked my phone right when it woke me, and right after it stopped, from about 8.02 a.m. to 8.36 a.m., although I'm not sure how long it'd been going on before it woke me. It was loud and strong and absolutely terrifying. We lay whispering for a time. No way was this a person or people. We started thinking, whatever it was, was trying to bust in through the roof, although the glass doors would surely have been easier to get through. When Eli said he was getting up to look, I told him about the doorknob shaking when I tried to get up. After a brief hesitation, he threw back his covers and sat up. The pounding stopped. He and I both froze. A terrible grating noise sliding on the roof broke the silence. We both looked at each other with big eyes and pale faces. Was that Claus? I hissed in the quietest voice I could manage. He leapt back up onto the bed, and the banging resumed. The quietest discussion ever followed about if we had really just heard claws up there. We thought it was exactly the sound huge claws would make, but really it could still be anything. Eli grabbed his legally owned firearm from his bedside drawer before quickly standing. The pounding stopped for a second to allow for another grinding rasp to sound across the roof. That is definitely freaking claws, I said. The pounding immediately resumed, twice as fast and even harder if that were possible. I could now feel the thumps reverberating through the bed. Eli told me to stay inside and listen. Whatever it was, it sounded huge, and he needed me to let him know what direction I heard it move in if it ran out of his view up there. He burst out the door and aimed his gun at the roof. The pounding stopped. There was absolute silence. There was no sound of running anywhere on the roof, and the roof didn't have a darn thing on it. In addition, being perched on the side of the hill as the cabin was with no trees nearby, there was nowhere anything up there could have gone. We packed at mock speed, but did have one last smoke in the driveway to help with the shaking and nerves. It was open, so it seemed relatively safe. While we smoked, we could hear the people who had been partying the last few nights. They were all out yelling for a missing friend. We heard them yelling about the last time they saw him, which was apparently the night before. We could hear their panic as they screamed his name over and over. Eli and I tried to find the group to help look and ask if they had seen or heard anything weird. 
However, the winding one-way dirt roads were confusing, and we ended up lost. We actually think they may have been locals, and we couldn't get to them because we were on rental cabin roads, which don't connect to local roads and driveways for obvious reasons. I really hope they found him passed out drunk in a bush somewhere. I regret not being able to locate them and help them look. I have no idea what this was. Nearly every major paranormal MO showed up. From orbs, weird calls, and poltergeist activity, to cryptid-type goings-on, and the lady in white. Yet it all really did seem like one thing in different outfits, if you will. After coming home, we had no more weird activity at the time. I did request for the departed to stand witness from a deceased brother who owed me a favor, but I specifically requested only the blessed dead, and only for the wedding ceremony. This didn't seem like protective ancestors to me though, so I don't think it was necessarily related. I actually lean towards some type of nature or elemental type guardian spirit personally, but that is just conjecture. Even though he said differently at the time, Eli now thinks it was a Bigfoot, although I think not. If you made it this far, thank you for your time and listening to my oh-so-memorable honeymoon. Any ideas on what we may have encountered are welcome. I'd love to hear what everyone thinks. Thank you, and best wishes. The Case of Dennis Martin This story is not a submission. It is a documented and tragic event that occurred in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Dennis Martin was a six-year-old boy. He and his family went on what was supposed to be a pleasant outing to the most popular national park in America, that of the Great Smoky Mountains. It was Father's Day weekend in 1969, the perfect time for a traditional family camping trip for the Martins. Together, they hiked from Cades Cove to Russell Field and camped overnight. The day after, they hiked to Spence Field near the Appalachian Trail. Once there, they planned to stay the night. Now, young Dennis Martin had allegedly been planning on surprising the adults of his family with his brother and some other children. His father last saw him going behind a bush to hide and wait for the proper moment to surprise everyone. Well, Dennis Martin was never seen alive again. Several minutes later, after the rest of the children had already returned to camp, Dennis's father went looking for him, searching the trail for nearly two miles, only stopping when he was completely sure that the boy couldn't have gone further. Searching for hours more, the family then received help from the National Park Service rangers but, as mysteriously happens with high frequency in missing person cases, a sudden downpour came down on the area. About three inches of rain poured over the land in just a few hours, washing out trails and bringing nearby streams to a flood. The temperature also dropped to about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Thus began the most extensive search and rescue effort in the park's history, even today. The search covered 56 square miles utilizing the efforts of around 1,400 people, which included the National Guard and Special Forces. The day after the disappearance, the rains gave way to a deep mist, further limiting search efforts. Footprints were found but were determined as being those of a Boy Scout who had participated in the search. These footprints, though, did lead to a stream before disappearing, and, stranger yet, the footprints indicated that one of the feet was barefoot, and yet none of the Boy Scout searchers were barefoot. This assumption was now brought into question. A shoe and sock were later found as well. Sadly, the search was called off after a failure to find much else. By June 29th, the search was abandoned. Dennis's father, desperate to find his son, offered a $5,000 reward for information on the whereabouts of his boy. That would be over $35,000 today. Still, no new information was found. Years later, a ginseng hunter claimed to stumble upon the skeletal remains of a child. Unfortunately, ginseng hunting was illegal, 
Therefore, he refused to approach authorities with the information or whereabouts of the remains, fearing that he would be charged. That's the end of Dennis Martin's tale. Several theories arose as to what may have happened to the poor boy, but one in particular stuck with the boy's father above all others, the theory that Dennis was taken by someone or something. You see, on the afternoon Dennis disappeared, a tourist by the name of Harold Key, along with his family, reportedly heard an enormous sickening scream and soon thereafter witnessed a disheveled-looking man run up the trail near the origin of the scream before he escaped into a white car. Other sources say the man had been attempting to hide himself behind a thicket and seemed to be carrying something over his shoulder. What happened to Dennis Martin? We may never know, but what we do know now is that national parks and deep, vast forests are beautiful places that must be tread carefully. Keep close attention to the ones you love and never be the last in line. The Mountain Road from Jacob I live in the Great Smoky Mountains in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. There are a ton of black bears here, and I've seen so many of them. I know what they look like, and I'm saying that for a reason. Now, I live on the side of a mountain, and our landlord lives up the mountain about a mile away. I used to love walking up that road, so I wouldn't mind walking our rent up there to his house, until one day last week. It was daytime, so I was calm and felt fine. I started my regular walk up the hill until on the walk back I felt this strange sensation. I don't know why, but I decided to turn around, and when I did, I saw something that I couldn't believe. This odd animal. It was big and black and on all fours, and my first thought was, it's just a bear, I'll be fine, until I really looked closer. I realized the two front arms were longer and bigger than the back. Then, even though I couldn't make out any facial features, I noticed it had a flat face. Now, being a little freaked out, I picked up my pace and was jerking my head to look behind me and in front of me, with only a second at most in between. I still don't know what I saw, and I hope never to find out. I know it's only been a week, and I know it was a very quick experience but I have not taken a step outside since then, except when I'm with another person. Anyone know what this strange creature or misshapen bear could have been? <laughs>